Hello folks and welcome to another edition of Theory Craft hosted by myself, Ben, and of course Jack, who's over there next to me. So we are two biggest nerds, if you haven't already noticed, who like to rant, rave and ramble about all things sci-fi, comic book or just anything we love. For this week we want to try and come up with some theories and thoughts about how the mutants are going to work within the MCU because as of what last year or the year before Disney bought out Fox yeah i be yeah i believe me yeah, i believe so with like the new mutants when we had all the trailers going which never went anywhere exactly so for the past 2 years most of us have known that yes we are going to get mutants eventually in the MCU but we haven't got the foggiest clue as to who, when, or how. And that's why we're here today. So, for me personally, yes, I do love Wolverine. There's no doubt about it that Hugh Jackman played the character superbly. But the issue is, is that I don't think we could have James Howlett Wolverine again. No, because let, of a, let's just get that out of the way straight away. Well, the thing is, it's like we've had three Wolverine movies. We've had three, no, not even three, sorry, six X-Men movies. Yeah. And he was a bit, he was, well, he's done a cameo in at least two of the, oh, was it just one or two of the... He had a cameo in Apocalypse. Yes, he did. So... He's been the best part of six, seven, six, seven years. Yeah, so 17 years. It's about six, seven movies that we've seen Wolverine. But the thing is, for those who of you who may not know, there are so many other versions of Wolverine that aren't even James Howlett. And the one that I want to try and pick up on is the version of his son called Jimmy Hudson which is the Ultimate Universe version of Wolverine. Now, I say the Ultimate version because for those, again, who may not know, the Marvel Cinematic Universe is based loosely on the Ultimate Universe of the Marvel Comics, which is vastly different to the standard 616 yeah. Marvel continuity. Yeah, yeah. So it would be not without the realms of possibility that we have... A different saga of mutants for this MCU. And at least with the idea of James Hudson, you get a bit more of a spin on things because you can also introduce the Guardian, who is also the Canadian version of Captain America, who is also the leader of Alpha Flight, which is also tied in with Captain Marvel. So at least there is a lot of chances of tying things in together without it just being like, ah. There's a mutant there, right? Yeah, done. The so, they, so like, like, so moving on from there. Obviously, because of the whole mutants thing. I mean, everybody who's watching this will watches this later. We've been talking about this for what a good month or so, trying to come up with a plot or an idea. Give or take, yeah. We've been yeah. sort of fiddling with the idea of how to bring in mutants and where they could actually be placed. Yeah, just because what we've had in the films that they were just there because they were there, but we won't need a definitive origin story just to settle just to settle this down, and so we have a basis of where to jump off from. So, what do you so what do you think, Ben? Should uh, we just go through like the general theories that we came up with? Yeah, let's go through the general theory so far of what we want as in terms of how the mutants come to exist. Okay, because. Within the normal Marvel universe, and of course with the the Fox movies, that it was just they were the next step of evolution. That's why they're mutants. But with the Ultimate Universe, it was more in terms of mutants came about through a catalyst, very similar in terms of the way that Captain America was created, that they had a serum of some kind that stimulated the X gene and thus creating mutants and the various powers. Yeah. And one thing I said to you was the fact that obviously Captain America was the first project, like the first beta test. 
And then you get Wolverine with being Weapon X was meant to be the... Weapon ten. 10, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But I think the best way to do with the idea of being a mastermind behind those projects is a very amazing, sinister character within the mutant regime called Mr. Sinister. Now, it seems a bit vague. It seems a bit... Ple- a bit generic, that the name. It all, it all makes sense as we go on. It all makes sense. So, essentially... What was his name? It was Nathaniel... Uh, what was his name again? Mr. Sinister, like his actual name. It was Nathaniel something or whatever, wasn't it? Yes, I think. Yeah, I think so. So essentially, he was a standard guy who was obsessed with the next step in human evolution to try and become immortal himself and become essentially like the most powerful being. And he originated back in the early 1800s, which also is where Wolverine, James Howlett, came from. Now, the theory that me and Jack both came up with is the idea that Mr. Sinister is the family doctor to James Howlett and thus comes across the idea of the X-Gene, and that's what sparks his curiosity. And so he is essentially a shadow figure behind all mutants up to modern day because of his many tinkerings with humanity. Yeah. And the biggest idea I thought would have been tied into brilliantly would be that he'd be the head honcho for the SSR who are responsible for creating Captain America, thus bringing in the concept that, although I argue different, that Captain America could be a mutant. Although I don't class him as one... I wouldn't class him as a mutant. No, but in terms... Because like, for, like, for, like, for me, a mutant is someone who... Uh, through genetics, someone is born with the mutant X gene. Exactly. However, this is loosely based on the Ultimate Universe, where people gain their powers through a catalyst instead of actually having X gene that gets triggered through trauma and other generic things. Yeah, because as we go through into... Because uh, I came up with this idea with you yesterday. With... Um... With, obviously, I assume that people who watch this will follow this channel um, have pro- probably most likely watched the film Logan, which is the last installment of Hugh Jackman as Wolverine, pa- James Howlett, Logan. And I, got, I think it was when uh, Logan says to Charles that there's been no new mutants that have been born for maybe something like 10 or 20 odd years. There's no new mutants for a while. So... If that could be a kind of a story plot that they're not they're, they're not maybe dying out, but there's just very few of them, or maybe that the uh, mutant X gene has gone into like a dormancy stage, mm-hmm. so it might take, as you said, a catalyst to trigger the mutant X gene again. So it's kind of like um, we're going to get a bit sciency. So if you take um, certain cells that all humans have in our bodies, and there's a there's a study supposedly that we have uh, all have like cancerous cells within our bodies, although they don't harm us. But it takes a certain catalyst or maybe illness or something to trigger that illness off. So that's where I came with the idea of having maybe an illness or maybe uh, some kind of cataclysmic event, which then triggers the mutant X gene in other mutants, maybe throughout the world as well. So that's how maybe we can see uh, varying varieties of mutants if we actually put this into like our fantasy film script. Exactly. I mean, the biggest issue that we've both had with this is trying to justify the idea that they've always existed within Marvel. Because I can guarantee when they do bring in mutants that they're going to say that they've been there all along. But it's hard to hide such a mass variety of people with varying degrees of abilities away from the public eye. But then does that mean we're going to have to like stray away from Apocalypse who first mutant? Well, this is again, this is the other issue is like mutants are so... We're back into a corner here. Yeah, well, all things mutants are so complicated because they have spanned throughout the entire Marvel universe within the comics from the very beginning. Yeah, we know very little about their origin. Well, the thing is with like all things 
the, there's so many different ways in which people within Marvel gain powers because you got the Inhumans, you got the Mutants, you got the Celestials who tinkered with early man DNA. There's the the thing is, I don't think there's an actual average man within Marvel. If you think about it, every single person within the planet Earth of Marvel has the potential of having p abilities in one way or another. Yeah. And it gets to the point where there are so many hidden factors that have tinkered with DNA in early man that I'm surprised that there is any basic humans because you've got Celestials, which will be eventually revealed in the Eternals movie that tinkered with early man DNA. You had the Kree, which created the Inhumans. And then you got the Eternals and the Deviants, which then spawn people like Thanos and the, uh, the other random beings. And it's hard to try and hide that throughout history of the MCU unless they can have a character which I mentioned to you called Forget-Me-Not. Now, this was only a guy that was brought in recently in the comics, and the way things have been going lately with at least Marvel is that if they ever introduce a random new character, they always seem to plop them into the new movies, the new TV shows, or whatever, as a means to draw in new people for their interest to try and explore the character deeper without having too much back history yeah so the point of forget me not is it's exactly what it says on the tin is that people can forget who he is for those who are wondering how his powers work if anyone is a doctor who fan it kind of works like the way of the weeping angels that you know they're there but if you look away, you forget about them, and that's it. Like you need to have your full attention on them for them to be conscious on your mind. But yeah. the issue is with Forget Me Not, is of course, that it only works on a small scale because he's not a overpowered mutant. However, this is where you could have the ploy of Xavier and Cerebro come in, conjoined with that power, to do a mass mind wipe so that the majority of the mutant population is unseen by the general populace, which would also add into the idea that they're feared by the general populace, and that's why nobody sees them. Yeah. But this is where I thought it would make a bit of sense of them to magically reappear, is because of the snap and the blip. So the MCU refers to what Thanos did in Infinity War as the snap, and then you get the blip, which is the five-year time jump to Endgame, where everyone comes back. Now, when I say yeah. everyone, it means everyone. So that would be the perfect opportunity to justify that we suddenly have mutants, but we don't know how, when, or where. But at least if yeah. we get the explanation that they were wiped from people's perspective, it makes it a bit easier to justify that they've been there all the time, but they just haven't been seen. Which then, which then introduces the fantastic new avenue of where now we have the opportunity to introduce maybe mutants that um, people have not heard of, don't know much about, maybe entirely new mutants, or even explore some ones that we've seen in films, but they might have just been a very small role. So um, we created a, quite a long list of mutants that we can Yes, with. we have, because both me and Jack are massive lovers of the 90s X-Men series because it oh, was yes. the best version of the X-Men series that you could ever have. I mean, to be so, fair, Wolverine did look a bit disproportionate. He did look like a massive triangle. But yeah. at the end of the day, this was a great series because it wasn't focused on just one person. There was so much diversity and everyone had a role to play. Yeah, so we're like focusing on that diversity. Um, we can. There's a few which we have attempted to cast. Few that we've agreed on. Few we've disagreed on. But we're just going to like just going to like spitball this and just see if any of you guys have any suggestions on who you think would be the best fit for these characters. So if we just go and just go through them like the ones we're certain of. So we had the idea for Mister Sinister's voice. So if you think about Mister Sinister's voice from the cartoons. And obviously with him being... It was British, wasn't he? He, yes. It was Nathaniel Essex. I just remembered his surname, Nathaniel Essex. 
yeah so we have so we have kind of that like a british based actor possibly and plus with like such like the deep resonance of his voice ben actually came up with what first suggestion and i came up with another one which we seem to agree on and the first suggestion that Ben had was James Earl Jones, or yes. a.k.a. Darth Vader, a.k.a. Mufasa. Yes. So I only mention him because he's got such a deep, booming voice that makes you yeah. sinister and very, I am your worst nightmare. But who else also has a very sinister voice in Lion King? So, Jeremy yes, Jeremy Irons. Also, as Alfred in the new Batman series, that was with Affleck. But no, I do see the point of Jeremy Irons because he's very tall and thin faced, just like Mr. Sinister. Yeah. And I think it could work, but it depends on how much CGI on him would be added later on because. Oh, a lot. Well, the thing is, Mr. Sinister is a very odd-looking mutant like yes yeah there's only a handful of mutants that don't look like humans like they i don't know what the obsession is with blue skin but you've got apocalypse <laughs> you got you got mystique you got nightcrawler and you got beast they're all blue including mr sinister so it's kind of a weird one to have blue skin but then i am curious as to whether it'd be like a dark greyish blue or whether it be like a TARDIS blue like behind me in my little TARDIS yeah but yeah so we both kind of agree the idea that it'd be Jeremy Irons both playing it and voicing it for Mr Sinister yeah just because I was good like I remember I was going through like all different kinds of actors because at first like we were like thinking of uh uh James Earl Jones also for Al Pacino's voice um Christopher Walken's voice as well and then I was watching like a little bit of Lion King and listened to Jeremy Irons voice and then I had a look back at scenes of Mr. Sinister and I thought oh okay that actually works quite well I like the sound of that and then I just I went into um, my InShot app on my phone and I cut some audio from uh, X-Men of Mr. Sinister's voice and um, added, and added it in, uh, like took the scene from took one of the scenes from Mrs. Sister and X Men, then added some audio from Jeremy Irons, and it just seemed to work just mm. really well. I don't know why it worked so well, but that was just how that came about. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, Mr. Sinister is the best idea I think for a villain because his obsession with the perfect DNA would explain the reason as to why there are so many mutants. Because it could be, as oh, I yeah. said earlier that he's the catalyst behind it all. But yeah. then we also want to try and add in our own team of mutants because oh, the X-Men this one. The X-Men team itself is not just Wolverine, Cyclops, Jean Grey and so on. There has been like yeah, like Storm. We've had like all the ones that we've seen that we've seen in the films, you know, all the ones that everybody knows, but it's a perfect opportunity to explore the ones that maybe people have either forgotten about or not mm. familiar with. Exactly. So first on our list is Spike, who we briefly saw within, was it X2 or was it the first no, X-Men? That, no, that knows no, in X3. X3. So Spike, for those who may not know, is also the uh, nephew to Storm. So the idea being that it's mostly going to be the lesser known side to mutants that we want to cast to try and show more diversity. Yeah. But it also, we want to try and hint towards what we already know, being the fact that Storm being related to Spike. Yeah. But there's also... This is the one that I fancasted with you straight away, and you were damn sure I was right on this, with Rogue being played by Rosario... Uh, Rosario Um and <laughs> the, the, but I can never remember her name. Um, let me just double I can check. I remember how to say her name. <laughs> let me have a look. Hang on, folks. This Little is technical. Bitch, folks. Yeah. So, like, just while Ben's doing that, if you can honestly ever, like, if you ever go onto Google, just Google her and just picture her as Rogue. And so, yeah. With, like, her mannerisms and everything, she just seems so perfect for this 
Alexandra Daddario is who I was thinking of, but yes, I will yeah. add into later on the fan art that I found that I showed you that someone had made it look like the 90s version of Rogue. Like, it's so yeah. spooky how well this is, and it's only just a fan drawing. And how much but... she looks like Rogue as well. Yes. But the thing is, supposedly, the news being that Rogue may turn up in Captain Marvel 2, which would be perfect because Rogue does actually have the powers of Captain Marvel during the 90s, yes. which not many people realise, because during the X-Men series, of course, she could fly and had blast powers, which was down to her stealing it from Captain Marvel, but they couldn't explain it, of course, at the time in the series. But it's just, I can't, I just hope to God that she gets the right accent because. Oh I, my. Yeah, I, Anna Paquin's horrible I, accent. <laughs> like, because, but, oh, just like, like, straight up, everybody will agree, Rogue in X Men was horrible. Absolutely but, freaking horrible. <laughs> The issue I had with Rogue in the trilogy we had was that she just wasn't useful. Like, that all was... she... She was literally just... The only reason she exists is because she brought in Logan to the X-Mansion, but they both end up getting... Ugh, it's just... It was so terrible, her she accent. Just never, it... She never did anything, either. I mean, I there's a bit where they're running away... And all she does is she grabs his leg so she can siphon his powers so he doesn't end up fighting, I think. Yeah, like, when, Py when Pyro's like um, setting fire to all the police cars next yes. to him. And it's just like, so you literally have to touch somebody and that's all you can do. That's a bit of a shoddy power. Obviously, the thing yeah. is with Rogue is that she is more than just that. She actually siphons someone's powers and thus has them for a certain extended amount of time. I think it depends on the power itself, depends on how much of a toll it takes on her. But she just seemed like a wet blanket. Like, yes, it, she just didn't seem to have much of a purpose. Even when it was Days of Future Past, her character was so bad that her only scene got deleted. Because there's a <laughs> there's a delete there's a deleted scene wait, where so she's was the, wait so wasn't that Anna Paquin as back as Rogue? Yeah, because there was a deleted <laughs> well there's a deleted scene where she's got captured by the Sentinels and they rescue her, but she's so drained from being used by the Sentinels oh, for God's sake. that she cut. That I think she dies in Wolverine's arms or something. I swear. Bloody useless. Like I just don't see the point of Rogue in those movies, but. Hopefully, although with the, the... Although the point that we did get was the love interest of Iceman, and Iceman is going to be reworked with the new actor, obviously, in our version. But yeah. also a massive character change, which I think will probably make a lot of people quite happy that we'll finally get some diversity, finally. Yes. Because there is the origin story, which I'm going to let you explain this one. So the thing is with Bobby Drake, also known as Iceman, is that uh, it was, I think, five, maybe ten years ago, he actually came out as gay and they did a Marvel comic where he got married. And yeah. I think it was underrated because I'm all for the idea of LGBTQT, but it's not very well shown within comics. And I think and we, that we don't we don't see like any homosexual superheroes ever. No, we don't. I mean, it's a real shame because... And uh, we live in such a time now where I think it's really important to bring in this kind of diversity. And what a better time to show it as well. Exactly. Because it just... Like... When they had Bobby Drake in the original trilogy, he just... I find it kind of ironic that both his love interests were women that he couldn't touch. You had Rogue, who... <laughs> well, he had Rogue, who he couldn't touch because she'd kill him. And then he had Kitty Pride, who was able to phase both women you couldn't touch. And the first... <laughs> but the thing is that came to my mind is MC Hammer. Can't touch it. Da, na, na. Da, da, da. <laughs> but it's just... It's a weird thing, because Can't I don't... Remember... the rest of that song, otherwise we get sued. <laughs> mm -hmm. But... That's why it needs to be brought in the Bobby Drake is gay and just get over it. Just bring in if the idea. there's ever a time to do it, this is the best time. Yes. But then we're also trying to figure out 
who else to bring in? Because I think there has been some characters that we've seen hints towards, but we never got the full potential. Such uh, as, such well, as I'd one say of your, one of our favourites, Darwin. Yes, Darwin. That that one is a bit of a stupid character that they wrote badly in first class. I couldn't understand why he was able to die. The whole point of his he's, ability... He's meant to adapt to anything. Now, I understand that he was overloaded with whatever energy that Sebastian Shaw placed in his mouth. But at the end of the day, he's supposed to be able to adapt. So it, you could easily just argue that he had a healing factor like Wolverine who could just heal over from the radiation or wherever the energy was. Well, yeah, you'd think. I mean, there was a meme I saw a while back, and I think it's really bad, and I don't know if I should say it on here, just in case it gets flagged. Can you keep it PG? So, someone put up the idea that why would you be a black guy back in the early 60s in America if you had the mutant ability to adapt? That that's sinking your mind. Yeah, see my point? Yeah, exactly. Anyway, uh... swift, swiftly moving on. But yeah, I think Darwin was very underrated. I think that we could have had more potential and he didn't really didn't do a lot. Like we didn't actually see him fight. We saw him shift into a bricky form. And we saw him spout gills when he went and planted his face in his in the water. That was it. Yeah. I it's don't remember like, him I just fighting. Thought, I just thought, like at that, like at that time, like during the sixties, everything when like the racism protests were at their highest with like Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, and everything. You know, and I, like I just like kind of think I just kind of thought like that character and that whole kind of plot was a bit unfair towards the actor, to be honest. But we're not going to get into that. That's no. going to be a long, long video. But anyway, it's just Darwin. I just think. Darwin has so much potential to do nearly anything. Well, this is the point of our list, is that we have so many mutants that have been underrated or barely used, but it's trying to make it work with some element of logic as well. Because the next one that I want to try and justify is Jubilee. Now, we saw her briefly in Apocalypse, but we never saw her powers. We never saw her throw fireworks. And granted, it is a bit of a crappy power to have. But the interesting thing is, is she does get turned into a vampire, which you yeah. could easily use as a later on character plot of sorts for either the upcoming Blade movie or for Morbius, because they're both yeah. vampire themed of sorts. So at least you could have an ex-man that's hinted at in one of those movies instead of it just being randomly there. Yeah. But it's trying to explain... I don't know whether to just have it that she's already been a vampire and that's that, or whether she is a mutant with her powers first and then gets turned into a vampire. I'd say, me, I'd say her powers first. I mean, her powers are probably the most pathetic ones that you could have as a mutant. Fireworks. All she, yeah, that's all she can do is throw fireworks out of her hands. It's like, okay, yeah, so, so, so does everybody else on the fourth of July? Does that make him a mutant? <laughs> yeah, well, that's a debate for another time. Uh, <laughs> but we also want to do a bit more with Angel because. Again, he was a bit underused within the films that we've seen. I mean, I still can't wrap my head around the timeline logic of the previous movies because you had Days of Future Past trilogy was obviously meant to be the current timeline. But then the First Class trilogy undid that because it was they showed in the original trilogy 1983 that Jean Grey, Angel and all that lot were barely what eight 
six, give or take. Something. There's inconsistency. Yeah. But then with the first class trilogy, you have Angel, uh, Cyclops, and Jean Grey all aged 16 to 18 in 1986. So you have yeah. a span of three years, but they've aged 10. Now, either someone mucked up and didn't realise, or there is two different timelines for these movies that somehow crossed over that we don't know. It's a, cl it's a cluster... Fudge. F yeah, cluster fudge. <laughs> yes. But the thing I want to see, at least, is have Angel be the proper version of Angel first... And then lead into the idea of him being Archangel, the weapon of the horseman of death that Apocalypse would make him into later on. Yeah. Because the whole thing with Angel is that his father hates mutants and he disapproves of them to the point where he, I think in the comics, he does try to end his life, but instead he saves somebody from jumping off a bridge by using his wings and thus becomes part of the X-Men because he's paraded round as a hero. Yeah. I don't know whether to add that in because it is a bit too dark for Disney, but you could add in the idea that he's not comfortable in his own skin, which would be a brilliant thing to use again for people yeah, that so. do have body dysmorphia. But it's... I mean, it was in X2 where you see a flashback of him as a kid when he's got a, ra a really massive razor and he's trying to hack away at the wings, which is a very dark thing to do. Yeah. But at the same point, I don't know how or if Disney could even use a scene like that for him because it's a bit too much. Yeah. But the other thing as well is... My all-time favourite character that I need to see done right is Gambit. Because, oh, yes. <laughs> because I just love the concept of the guy that he was just literally... He threw playing cards that spontaneously combusted because he had the mutant ability to supercharge the potential energy and stuff. That was literally what he could do. 